So I'm going to hand you over to Philippa and Carolyn at Lincolnshire County Council, and they're going to be talking to you about the voice of a child during a pandemic. Over to you. Hello, welcome to our presentation today about voice of the child in the pandemic. On the call today from Lincolnshire Children's Services are myself, Carolyn Knight, Head of Service, uh, Philippa Gallup, Team Manager and April Burke, Practice Advisor. I'm just going to hold fire while, oh there we go, the presentation's put up. Um, so Lincolnshire, like all other local authorities, delivers a vast number of services to children, young people and families to ensure they are safe, well and supported. The unprecedented circumstances presented by COVID-19 pandemic created additional challenges and we had to learn to adapt very quickly. Due to the spread of the virus and the strict measures imposed by the UK government, children's services had to redesign service delivery to ensure that the most critical services that keep children, young people and families safe continued to be delivered in an effective way. Such adaptations included the setting up of risk and decision logs, rag ratings for visits to ensure the most vulnerable children and people were safeguarded. And obviously, as evidence today, IT became absolutely crucial. So Lincolnshire prides itself on creativity, innovation and the relationships we build with children, young people and their families. And we hope to show you how we've adapted our measures to ensure experiences were positive, and some examples of creative working and ways in which we captured this staff, for, captured this for staff and learning, and also um, with, as we have responsibilities for quality assurance, how we QA this for the service. So I'm going to hand over to Phil now, and she's going to talk to you a bit more about how we achieved this. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, the key element of our new normal was quality assurance and how we responded to the needs of children and families in the crisis. Capturing the voice of the child presented more challenges with the, with the restrictions in place, especially for our younger children. Our main source of voice of the child was through quality audits. Our quality audit schedule was revised to further enhance the voice of the child. Our progress plan audit highlighted that overall the cases seemed seen demonstrated a flexible approach in meeting the needs of children and families and ensuring that progress was made against plans despite the restrictions in place. A range of good practice examples were seen that demonstrated both persistence in ensuring children were seen and heard as well as creative approach to meeting the needs of the families during this time. This learning formed the basis of practice lead sessions for managers. A specific voice of the child audit was undertaken as a priority in Lincolnshire and it found that workers were being more creative to enable all children and young people to share their voice. The workers advocated the creative use of social media. The audits highlight the impact of using clear language that children understand and using the children's voice in assessments with some clear descriptions highlighted in danger statements and safety goals. We developed a practice lead session in front for frontline supervisors and from these sessions a top tips evaluation sheet um, was produced. Throughout so lockdown, our participation team contacted young people with lived experiences of child protection, children in care and leaving care processes. They found that some young people and families found it easier to build relationships with workers and in meetings such as child protection conferences online rather than physically attending. Some young people chose to attend their reviews for the first time because they have the option of doing this virtually. Attendance at meetings did improve for some families and young people as a result. Going forward, young people will be offered the choice as to how they would like to participate in their reviews or any meetings about them. In terms of the leaving care pathway, the participation team contacted over 40 young people for their views on the assessment and the plan. Some agreed the process was good and their social workers wrote things down as they spoke. One young person said it was really good to say what you thought and for it to be included in their assessment. And another one said, 
that they were able to say things and it's good because then I don't have to go to court. Um, I'm going to hand over to April now, who's going to actually talk you through some actual examples of uh, some good practice in, get, in getting the voice of the young person. Yeah, OK, thanks, Caroline. So we've got some examples here of some lovely direct work that was undertaken. The first one with the little baby and um, the worker began working with mum when she was pregnant. Um, her anxiety was so bad, she really struggled just to leave the flat and professionals had to do all the shopping for her as she couldn't get as far as the shop. The worker gradually encouraged, encouraged mum to go for short walks with her and once lockdown began the early help worker continued to support mum and her six-month-old baby. The worker used technology such as WhatsApp to engage with mum and these sessions such as baby massage which were done virtually. Next one the little boy in lockdown teams are community, communicating well with families and giving them ideas for play and interaction and this young man in this picture here is enjoying some really simple play thanks to the help and support his mum received from one of our early help teams. This picture here shows the work of video conference in a family. She used a homemade signs of safety scaling tool complete with emojis on a fridge for everyone in the family to scale how things are going. The whole family really enjoyed it. This was a fantastic idea to make sure we are all still using the signs of safety framework to underpin our work with children and families. This worker is undertaking um, direct work on a video call with a child showing another example of working differently with social media and still making a difference. And this one is me and I was deployed back to the frontline social care team last year. So I was creatively using scaling to support the progress um, for the children. So you can see there's lots of interaction despite working at home. Creative CAMS, Lincoln and Grantham Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service made and delivered created CAMS craft boxes for young people identified as being isolated or just struggling through lockdown. These provide craft activities, resources, linking in with Creative Cam's videos on YouTube. Feedback from young people was really positive, as you can see there. This one was a really lovely activity. This was a party style invitation. A social worker created this for two little girls, which was followed by a virtual party where direct work was completed for a section seven report. The social worker and children dressed up creatively, as you can see, to gather the wishes and feelings, completing feelings cards on the wall behind the social worker in a non-intrusive way due to being un unable to visit these young people. These are some of the photos from workers on their creative involvement with children and young people from growing sunflowers to building a goal for goalkeeper practice, along with some of the comments from young people, which we found when auditing the plans and assessments during the pandemic. One of the ways Lincolnshire promotes learning and sharing of practice is by leading practitioners through an action learning set process. An action learning set is an approach to explore what skills and behaviour they used in certain pieces of practice. The practice chosen was a piece of work by the voice of the child work. When reflecting, the practitioners felt that this wasn't a good piece of voice of the child work as the child had come into care when they were really trying to support with the network. However, as further exploration and guided discovery occurred, they came to reflect that their use of observations in this really difficult time for the family was actually a really positive piece of advocacy for these girls. This short ex extract is reflecting on the process for the worker. Would you like me to show the film uh, for you? Because I don't think there's any sound coming out at the moment. Oh, 
sorry yeah it's if you could share the audio sorry yeah no problem i'll get it going I don't think it's working, is it? Just loading it up now, bear with oh, me. Sorry. <laughs> Should be able to do it for you. <laughs> Give it a go anyway. How's that? Is that one hour? No sound, Kate. No sound. No, I, I, we could share it. Oh, so sorry. I don't think that's, no, that's um, fine. meant to happen. We can share it after. after. We can share we can it after. We just, just finished. No problem. The final, uh, Back to you final then. Slide. Thank okay. you. I think we've only got one slide left anyway. So uh, what Lincolnshire is uh, most proud of is that there was minimal disruption really to its service delivery through robust planning by all service areas. And we knew we needed to find a way that supported everyone to make sure we kept at the forefront of our minds the lived experience of children and young people. We needed children and young people to know that their voices mattered no matter what, and that we understood what their experiences meant for them in the COVID climate. We will continue to build on the progress we have made as a local authority to ensure that even during challenging times, the child's voice is heard, listened to and understood in order to bring about change. Moving forward, we need to reflect and learn from those areas for development. So thank you for listening today. And we will leave you with some contact details should you wish to get in touch and want any more information. So that was really a whistle stop tour of Lincolnshire and the voice of the child in the pandemic. So thank you. That's wonderful. Thanks so much uh, for that um, really interesting um, picture of the work you've been doing. Thank you to April for talking us through that too as well. And um, now we're going to move on to Kelly and Chris who are at Rutland County Council and they're going to talk to us about their peer to be peer review model. So over to you, Kelly and Chris. Thank you. I'll just upload presentation. Maybe a moment. Just while you're doing that, Kelly, if I can just remind people, if you if you are speaking, have your cameras on, and if you're not, if you wouldn't mind turning them off, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Right, that should be up now. Um, OK, so thank you. My name is Kelly McAleese. I'm the Adult Social Care Principal Social Worker for Rutland County Council and Chair of the East Midlands PSW Network. And my colleague Chris is kindly presenting with me. So Chris, I don't know if you want to do an intro. Thank you, Kelly, for that. Yes, I'm Chris Erskine. I'm Principal Social Worker and the Professional for Lincolnshire County Out. Council Adult Care. I'm very much here to, to support Kelly. Uh, today <clears throat> we're going to be talking to you about uh, the East Midlands ADAS and East Midlands PSW network uh, developments around peer review. Um, so some of you might have experienced being part of a peer review before, um, but the team to team for us was an opportunity to really create something that allows frontline social workers and other professionals to be part of um, feeding back, experiencing different authorities. Um, the previous format of peer review is often led by social work management. Um, so some people might have experienced being brought in and um, interviewed, um, and they tended to focus on a broad topic such as safeguarding or carer support. Um, the team to team is, is different in that it focuses on a bit of a narrower topic and 
it's more focused on social work practice. And, and that was something which for us in the East Midlands Network was really important that we make sure that our social workers in each authority are included in providing feedback about the authority that they're working in and that they get to experience other areas and uh, other ways of social work practice. So the team to team is quite informal. Um, it involves picking a group of um, five, six, seven social workers but it can include other practitioners from other areas, so non-regulated professionals or occupational therapy. Um, and they are asked to visit another local authority and explore a particular area of practice. Um, and that tends to be a one day visit, but we'll go on to talk about how we've made some adjustments to that. Um, and for us, for, for us in the PSW network, it's really about developing that environment of learning so that practitioners get the opportunity to feel that they're contributing to changes and developments and that their voices are being listened to by strategic management within our authorities. Um, as with most things, we have got a process in place for the team to team. Um, and ultimately it is led by um, the directors of adult social services, um, but they are the ones responsible for identifying that initial key line of inquiry. So that key line of inquiry, that starting point for the team to team tends to be um, a data. So it tends to be something from a national report or a local report. Um, and it's then the responsibility of the principal social workers to um, make that more accessible for the visiting practitioners. So we might have a piece of data about safeguarding, something that is a bit anomalous, um, but it's then for Chris and I and the rest of the region to make sure that we pull that back to what does it actually mean for social work practice? Um, I think we've probably experienced that data isn't always used positively to reflect practice. And for us, it's really important that that data has a social work voice behind it. And that is what the visiting social workers are responsible for doing. So this is something that's interesting, this piece of data, but what does it actually mean for us in social work practice? What are we actually looking at? Um, and that is what those early stages and planning are for. Um, we will give the social workers some prompts. Um, I think we picked up quite early on that all of the social workers really enjoyed the experience of visiting each other. Um, but there is a risk that um, social workers will will go off on a bit of a tangent. They get very excited about learning about different authorities. Um, we do have to try and keep on track. However, we got some really interesting feedback um, from the social workers when they visited about other areas, um, not necessarily directly related to that initial key line of inquiry, and that's OK, um, because for us it was about also giving our practitioners autonomy to really embed in a different team and experience something different and to then bring it back to the original authority. Um, we do have the on-site visit and then we will also produce a report at the end of it, which is signed off um, by East Midlands ADAS. And there might be an action plan in there with some uh, areas that um, each authority wants to focus on. Um, but the important part of the team to team is that we do need to connect that circle. You know, what we didn't want to happen was we didn't want social workers to be involved in something and then feel like there were no outcomes at the end of it. So we do have that layer of, of review to make sure that if we're giving social workers this interesting opportunity to visit another authority and provide feedback, that they don't just feel that that feedback disappears at the end of it, because that can be really quite demoralising for practitioners who have been involved in this. Um, and just to kind of give you a bit of a practical overview of what the team to teams have looked like, um, we have done previous ones, Rutland and Lincolnshire were the first, um, and Rutland's team to team was originally undertaken in November 2019, where Lincolnshire came to visit us. Um, and our key line of inquiry was to look at why there was some variation in Rutland between what we spend per person on long term care um, versus our all age. And for, for us in Rutland, that is our preventative support because we operate and have done for the last five or six years 
a preventative model of, of social care. So we intervene early at pre-eligible level. Um, and obviously that has involved some investment. So we really wanted to have a look at whether our practitioners really feel that that's embedded, that preventative ethos, um, and to look at the efficiency of that. And that was from a, a finance report as a starting point. Um, but when we looked at scoping out, um, I wouldn't obviously expect the practitioners to, to question on that area from a finance report. But what I was interested in Lincolnshire coming and talking to us about was what do we do from a prevention perspective? So the social workers had those questions set out, a bit of a guide, um, and Lincolnshire practitioners spoke to them about um, community assets and talk me through an experience of what you might do when you first have a contact with somebody through our front door. Um, come out on a visit with us, experience what it's like. And that was a one day visit, um, lots of one to ones, Lincolnshire embedded it with our team. And Chris and I also spent the day together. So PSWs are very involved in the team to team when we're, we're not outside of it, we're part of it. So Chris and I also spent the day looking at um, quality assurance and policies and things like that. Um, so that was the first one. And Chris will talk to you quickly about Lincolnshire and how that's slightly varied, because as you can see, um, we actually undertook the Lincolnshire one um, July 2020, um, when we were obviously in the middle of a difficult time in social care. OK, thank you for the introduction, Kelly. Yeah, so very, very different when we came to when, when Rutland um, came to, to Lincolnshire. So in Lincolnshire, we were looking very much around variation in terms of placements into long term care. I mean, in comparison to similar sized local authorities. Um, one of the things we, we, we had to do differently was very much about um, still focusing on practice, but we had to really get creative in how to undertake the peer review. So we moved forward and I think it's fair to say we took some risks and worked differently to how we, we had done when we visited Rutland. So we weren't able to, to have an initial session with colleagues in Rutland and provide pastries and coffee as, as Kelly kindly did for us when we visited when we visited Rutland. But, um, we did look at the ways we could, could continue to develop and link insurance and support people to live a good life for, for longer. Um, so some of the ways we did that were one-to-one -one video interviews with practitioners via Teams. Um, we met with, with, the, with the director, principal social worker, all of us together. Um, and we looked at some case file audits as well, as well as looking at the tools we use in link insurance and getting feedback from, from that. Um, we also were really mindful of, of, of undertaking a review while people really have very busy schedules and lots of the pressures different local authorities were experiencing. But we did want to really, as I say, do the right thing. Our practitioners were really very engaged from both Rutland and Lincolnshire, got lots of benefit from, from, the, from, from, the, from the review. Um, I mean, we, we did have to come a long way in terms of using technology and becoming more confident in quite a short space of time. I think it's something that we, we all have done which really supported us to continue and make sure the review could take place in the way that it did. Um, we, we, we were definitely up for a challenge and whilst it was harder to do it, I think virtually, and um, we still got a good result from that in terms of identifying ways we could, could move forward as, as well. And, and again, I would reiterate what Kelly said in terms of it gives frontline practitioners the opportunity to influence practice and it did give us some feedback from practitioners as well about how they were managing what was working well for them um, during during the pandemic, as well as the business as usual parts. Can we move to the next slide, Kelly? So in terms of when we visited Rutland, um, what came across in Rutland was practitioners were extremely proud of, of the work they did in Rutland, and there was a real overarching ethos of prevention and supporting people to, to live a good life. And um, practitioners reflected very much that they enjoyed working in, in Rutland, and were able to work people at a really early stage, so getting support people at, at the right time, the right support at the right time for them as well. Um, we did pick up on a, a lot of things that we found were very interesting in Rutland in terms of planning for getting old um, and, and various initiatives there. Um, one of the things that we really did observe was the ability to get really quick responses from, from um, for, for decision making. So there was delegated decision making in, in Rutland as well. Again, things that um, probably were reflected back at us actually from the, from the visit to, to Lincolnshire. But there really was a, a focus in Rutland as well around using data in the right way to reflect social work practice um, and the use of bespoke KPIs as well for adult care there. So it was lots of learning for us and our, our practitioners very much reflected positively on, on the visit to Rutland. Um, 
And similarly, when we visited Lincolnshire, um, we also were able to provide a lot of positive feedback. And that is a strength of the model of peer review because this feedback is provided from the frontline social workers, um, you know, who are experts um, and they are the ones that are out there visiting clients, visiting adults. So obviously in Lincolnshire, we looked at the practice of placement um, within adults with learning disabilities and older adults. So there was lots of real positives um, that came out of our visit to Lincolnshire around their integrated approaches, um, around their um, ability to be really strengths based from the first point of contact. Their assessment was really positive and there was a real positive approach from practitioners in Lincolnshire that they were making the right decisions in partnership with adults at the right time for them. So obviously we do connect our key line of inquiry. Um, so this feedback for us really cemented that, yes, Lincolnshire might be presenting as an outlier in certain respects, but actually the practice of frontline social workers in older adults and LD was really positive and they had great working relationships and were really passionate about the work, the support they provided to people. P uh, team to team is also about feedback though. It's about identifying areas for development, um, something which is really important for our frontline practitioners to experience and also for us as an organisation to recognise that there are benefits to having challenge and debate. Um, so the team to team is a great example of that. Um, and there were areas that we both recognised that we might wish to explore and focus on. Things around training, um, developing different tools, reviewing our assessments, strengthening co-production. Um, so they were some of the specifics for Rutland um, and for Lincolnshire. Yeah, so, so for Lincolnshire, I think it, it, it was really a good opportunity for, for us to be able to check and explore, coupled together with the practitioner feedback. Um, so we did look at things and, and it has really fed into our development work and our, our development program as, as we go forward in terms of making sure we've got citizen feedback on how we can increase practitioner autonomy, reduce processes and support MDT approaches. And we've taken some actions already and some of that's now longer term work plan. So it, it has been a really positive experience and that ability for practitioners to, to, to influence strategically the way we move forward as well has been very, very positive. Um, and obviously the team to team is a developing process, so we have learnt um, at this point and I think we anticipate that we're going to continue to learn. We've made changes, we've adapted, we've been flexible. Um, and for us, just some of our lessons um, are around making sure that we are quite specific about what we're asking practitioners to look at. Um, we don't want to limit practitioners. We appreciate that they they've enjoyed the experience, that it, it was a great way of sharing and boosting morale and, and um, giving practitioners permission um, and autonomy to have that involvement in developments in their own service. Um, but it is quite easy to go off topic. And I think Chris and I were guilty of that when we both um, took part in the team to team. And um, there are lots of things we're interested in sharing. The team to team can include anyone that's relevant. So we might have directorates that are made up of commissioning, housing, depending on what you're focusing on, you can include anyone who is in a frontline role. Um, but importantly, we felt that should probably stop at team manager level. Um, we really did want to make sure it, it is frontline focused. It is about practice. So that feedback is beneficial and about social work or therapy practice. Um, as Chris has said, we did use Teams um, and Video Tech for a lot of the Lincolnshire um, review. I think we've acknowledged that there's lots of benefits to video conferencing, but we wouldn't necessarily want to have that as the only method of using, uh, of undertaking the team to team. We would definitely want to encourage frontline practitioners visiting each other and really embedding in a team for the day. Um, so that they feel that they are, they have become part of that hosting authority in that moment. Um, and we would definitely include audit as well. We, we undertook audits in Lincolnshire Anonymised because we focused on strengths based practice. So Rutland audited some of Lincolnshire's assessments and that was really useful and we would definitely take that forwards in the future. 
Um, organization is very important. It did take a, quite a bit of planning. Um, so Chris and I both recognize that having some support for that is, is quite key. Um, and we'd really want to strengthen that aspect of co-production. We were able to incorporate some service user views, um, but we would definitely want to make sure that that was strengthened in the, um, the next programme of Team to Teams that we're undertaking over the year. Um, and it was very important that practitioners um, were given feedback about the learning and about the action plan that was agreed by the director at the end of it, um, because for us, it really connects to that developing approach to having an organisation that recognises expertise in its social workers and includes them in developing services, in developing assessments and tools. And we all have those communities of practice in place, I'm sure, those champion roles, um, those practitioner forums. But what we recognised when we were undertaking this is that sometimes those practitioners do require a bit of permission and they do require those opportunities. So it was just a great reminder. Um, hopefully we'll be able to share the slides and if anyone is interested in any more about the team to team or any discussions, um, then Chris and I would be more than happy to talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, so you'd be welcome to get in touch if you did want some further information. And I think I'm running over time now, so I will stop. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. I did just pop my hand up subtly. I'm so sorry, uh, but we, we are running out of time and have to go to the next speaker now. But um, thank you ever so much for sharing that system with us um, mm. and uh, the work that you found and the learning that, that happened. It's invaluable. Um, so on to our third and final speakers corner session. And um, I want to introduce um, Sally and Rushma, who are here on behalf of uh, Birmingham City University. Um, and they're going to, to um, introduce themselves and talk to us about their COVID diaries. And then we're going to watch a film. So over to you guys. Hi, so I'm Rushma Patel. Um, I'm an expert by experience. And I my role is slightly different in that I I actually coordinate all the experts by experience alongside Sally Andrews and I'll pass you over to my colleague. Uh, thanks Resh. So my name's Sally. Um, I'm one of the teaching team, one of the social workers at the university. Um, it's my pleasure to work alongside Resh and a brilliant team of experts by experience. And during the pandemic, um, we started a project that was around um, COVID diaries, so capturing some of the unique experiences of our experts by experience. And we just want to share these with you. And, you know, whether you're student social workers or you're social workers in practice, um, you know, we feel that this is a, a real opportunity to, um, you know, hear directly from people who have been living um, within the times of the pandemic really thank you i think if we could just add before we put the video on um just to remember one of the sayings that came up in covid was we're all in the same storm but in different boats and if you could start the video for us Will do. And just to say, um, before this final film, um, the moderator will post a survey for today's session in the chat box for you to give us some feedback. Um, and this session is being recorded, so you will find it on YouTube after today. So I'm going to share the video um, for you guys right now. Thank you. And any feedback that you have for our experts who aren't here would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So my name is Reshma Patel. I am the expert by experience consultant here at Birmingham City University. In this video, we hope to show you our COVID experience since last month. And in it, we also hope to be able to demonstrate how important it is for practitioners, social workers, students, and everyone just to realize that we've all experienced COVID in a different way. Hello everyone, my name is Graham Price and I'm a member of the E group, that's the Experts by Experience with the City of Birmingham University. And I'm delighted to be part of this project, which I'm going to share with you and I hope you will enjoy it. The first one was written in May and it goes like this. This is it. Is this life? A time in place or a place in time? Is this it? Can we? Should we? celebrate yes no 
maybe, or if needed, together work, change, then we can celebrate. We all have a good life and rejoice. This is it. So my name is Karen Hillier and this is Tuesday the 16th of February. I spoke to my sister yesterday. Her father-in-law's funeral is on Friday. Mother-in-law decided she will go. She's in the care home where she is a resident in its proving to be very caring and the two carers have taken her under their wing and one will go to the funeral with her. My sister was having a conversation with her saying, you know, mom might not understand why they can't hug her. And she said, don't worry, I will transfer all your hugs to her and I will hold her hand throughout the service. There are good people out there. Right, hello, my name's Alma Featherstone and I'd like to share you a, a little bit from my diary too. What did we appreciate? The immediate support came from our immediate family, which enabled us to isolate as soon as lockdown started by taking over responsibility for our regular food shopping and telephone contact. The local volunteers allowed us to receive on the doorstep all our prescribed medication from the local pharmacy, sharing the occasional supermarket shopping delivery by our next door neighbour, friend and neighbour, allowed us to keep our food supplies topped up. We realised just how fortunate we are with the location of our home close to the countryside. Being in lockdown for so long, we are so grateful that we have not downsized and were able to spend time together and still have the use of other rooms in which we could be involved in other activities. How fortunate we were to have labour-saving devices, making life more comfortable and the use of modern technology, something we had more time to learn and use and which we had not found necessary previously. We now know our neighbours much more intimately and have become more concerned for their well-being. We appreciate more telephone calls rather than emails so that we can now notice the variations in tone of voice of the person we are talking to and giving people time. What did we miss seeing face to face rather than images generated by technology? The most significant shock to me throughout the pandemic was the need for the government to tell the public to wash their hands regularly in order to stop the spread of infection and continues to do so. This is Stuart Hendry, COVID Diaries uh, 2020. Well, this week started with a bang, 23rd of March 2020. A realisation that finances income are going to be a struggle now. Quite worrying. So, blimey. I had a letter this that morning stating that I'm in an extremely vulnerable group and should be self-isolating for 12 weeks uh, due to my severe asthma. And if I caught COVID-19, I would be seriously ill. I didn't know that 12 weeks would probably turn into 12 months. <laughs> It's quite a, a long time uh, to be on your own. So, great. I'm in a category of 1.5 million people now. Um, I did not realise I was that bad, really. Uh, great, I'm going to be stuck at home with my wife and two cats, Prince and Smokey. Brilliant. It's going to take me uh, quite a while to adjust. Um, I'm usually I'm at work most of the time and socialising and all sorts. So uh, it's going to be real difficult being at home to start with. And also, we're having also not having any contact with our family or social distancing. Our problems with social distancing comes to an end as well. Uh, it's going to be a major impact for me, I think. I think it's really important for social work practitioners and other mental health workers to take on board isolation, withdrawal from social contact, and the impact on social anxiety and paranoia, paranoia partly caused by COVID-19 shutdown and social distancing and always on the news. I think it's also it also plays into the idea if you get very depressed and withdrawal in a way when you're not well, and when you withdraw in as well from society and people has a massive impact on people and your sort of sense of self as well. I'm just going to read you a paragraph of my diary. Again, it was a January 2021 diary. It was like Aisha's weekend on again. Start, take a deep breath. And I know I should be happy that she is reliable, but I can't help but bite her head off, especially during the night. Facebook just shows so many horror stories. Friends of mine 
that are on direct payments that are somehow struggling. So somehow I should feel grateful, shouldn't I? Well, why should I feel grateful? Grateful for what? People are being paid that, you know, it is COVID. It feels like I'm going back in time to the early 90s where we would dare say anything to anyone in the fear of being left alone without support. I feel I'm going to lose it if I say anything. If I don't get this COVID out of the way soon, I will be really, really scared. I am a young person living in supported living accommodation due to my autism and pervasive mental health difficulties. Throughout the Christmas break, when there were more COVID restrictions, I took a large overdose of paracetamol, ending up in me needing a cannula drip for a few days in hospital. This was a self-harm attempt. In this crisis, I became aware of the support staff around, around me having differing levels of competency. I needed a care response during this time, and when I professed that I thought nobody cared about me, this particular staff member became very angry with me and raised their voice at me in this time of distress. This contributed towards my overdose. And all of these little examples and these little stories help us to share this to students and to give the students an insight on the reflections of our expert by experiences. Resh, could you tell us why you think the COVID diaries are important for social workers and those training to be social workers? Because I think sometimes when People come into our houses just for one visit. They only see that snapshot. Someone in my case, they see an assertive person, a person who's, you know, can do everything and can manage everything and don't actually see what goes on behind the scenes. So hopefully it will enhance student learning, practitioner learning, because there's been a diverse group of us that have shared our own personal experience of our COVID reflections. Thank you, Ash. Karen? Well, I think this has been a sort of, you know, an experience that none of us thought that we would experience. It's, and I'm not trying to compare it, but it's like people who experienced things in the Second World War, how it changed their lives. And, and how we go back and look at how they manage things and what happened to them during that period. And I think it's good for the students to be able to look at these diaries and hear our voices and um, sort of take some learning from it, from you know the different experiences, the wide experiences that we've all had during this period. Um, whether they had, some people had lots of support Others had support taken away. So I think it's a really rich learning experience for them. Thank you, Karen. And Al Sorry, as Karen mentioned, everyone, everyone's experience is very different, but it's a phase in our history that we mustn't forget. And it should, um, maybe the COVID diary should be in, in the library or something like that. And also, different things come to mind when someone I rang up the other day and asked how they were. And the, the person said, oh, well, it's the highlight of, of my day. I'm going to put the dustbin out today and I'm going to see if I can see anyone I know. And at first, I didn't quite comprehend the meaning of that. And then I just thought the loneliness in that first mm -hmm. voice, it was heartbreaking. And then someone else said, because no one had spoken to them for several days, they lived alone. When they went to speak, things came out of their mouth. And they started to try and say poems to, to make it use their voice. Exiting COVID or getting out. I want to write. I want to dance. I want to work. I want to play. I even want to muck about. Surely it's time to let me out. I mean, really, let me out. I want to shout and shout and shout. Who doesn't want to let it all hang out? Well, some don't. And there are reasons we should think about. And with generosity, take them into account. Thank you.
Well, that was uh, really wonderful to um, watch that film. Thank you ever so much for sharing that with us. And um, we don't, in fact, have enough time for Q&A at the end of this speaker's corner, I'm afraid, because it's been such a packed and varied agenda. But it does leave me to suggest that attendees take a look in the chat box if you can, because Laura, our roving illustrator, has illustrated speaker's corner for us today. And she's posted her work. Oh, hello, Laura. There you are. You're going to hold it up to the camera. Perfect. You're on mute, by the way. Again, no session Hi, complete please. without that. How did you get Hi, on? Hi, everybody. Good. Um, I got kicked out several times. Uh, so unfortunately, I can't share my screen because I'm an attendee and not a panellist. But the link in the chat will yep. take you to um, to there. So you might be able to share your screen from, from your end. Um, that's a possibility. Um, but there is um, some notes up there from our first two speakers, and I've also taken some notes on the COVID diaries too, um, as well. So you'll have both up there. But thank you for having me. I apologise, I can't show you because the tech is against us, um, but uh, the link is there. That's okay, Laura. Um, it's it's uh, usually a few gremlins in the, in the works, um, but the the picture that you. Um, that you drew is is in the chat for people to look at themselves as well so that's wonderful thank you for for doing that for us um just no to worries. mention for those of you who are registered social workers who joined the session today today's session does constitute cpd for you so you can count this as a bit of your learning um cpd if you want to do that and then it just leaves me to say a massive thank you to all three session um, presenters that have joined us today on this um, Social Work Week event. Uh, thank you ever so much for sharing your work and your learning um, and uh, being part of this really pivotal week for the profession. We're really grateful and lovely to have you on board. So thank you everyone for um, being with us today and if you're going to any more Social Work Week events, I hope you enjoy them very much. Take care, all the best and goodbye.